Good evening. Thank you for joining us. My name is Karen Collins, and I'm one of the counselors from the Center for College Planning. And tonight you've joined us for Homeschool to College, Transcript Insight from Admission Counselors. So we are really happy to be joined by three amazing panelists, and we're gonna introduce them in just a moment. A couple of real quick things. So you'll notice on your toolbar that you have a little arrow and it says questions. That's where you can send us some questions that you might have during the presentation. So feel free to use that. Um, my colleague Michelle here is going to be taking your questions behind the scenes um, and we'll get those answered by our panelists as we move through the night. If for some reason we don't get to it immediately, it could be that Michelle's holding on to that question because we're coming to it in just a moment. Um, or it could be that we're gonna hold that to the end because that's a unique question that we, have in, um, that we don't have in our PowerPoint presentation. So um, we will get to them. So hang tight with us as we go through the process. Um, again, I want to introduce my colleague and friend, Michelle Lavelle, and I'm going to let her introduce herself. Hi, thank you so much, Karen. This is great. My name is Michelle Lavelle. I'm the director and one of the co-founders of Granite State Home Educators. And so I'm really, really thrilled to partner with Karen and Neef to provide these uh, guidance counselor types events to the New Hampshire homeschool community. And I want to thank our panelists for being able to share their expertise with homeschoolers. Uh, this is a component we found that many high school students and families uh, need because their intention is to go on to high to college, but uh, they can't always access this information. So we hope this is a great resource for you as you begin to plan for your students post-secondary journey. And, uh, you know, if you have any questions afterwards, we have a lot of NEAF resources on the website, which is granitestatehomeeducators.org. And certainly, uh, you know, if you have questions after tonight's event, I'll know exactly where to find Karen afterwards. And hopefully this will be one in a series of events we open up to homeschoolers. So Absolutely. enjoy tonight. Absolutely. Thank you. And so now I'd really like to introduce to you our panelists who have come out to join us this evening and who are really the experts in this piece of the admissions puzzle. So first, let me introduce to you Mercy Laura Bautista, and she is from St. Anselm College. Hi, all. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm Karen Mish, and my name is Mercy Laura Bautista. I'm one of the counselors at Seneasum College. Um, thank you so much for being here today, and I'm hoping to share more information about my experience reviewing homeschool transcripts over the last three years at Seneasum College. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. And now our colleague Rob McGann is from the University of New Hampshire. Uh, good evening. Thanks for having me. I'm very glad to join you this evening. Uh, I've been at UNH for about uh, 17, 18 years, been working in college admissions for over 30. Uh, so homeschooled students are a very familiar part of the landscape for us. Uh, I'll give you some context at UNH, we probably enroll anywhere between 25 and 50 homeschooled students each year. So it's a pretty familiar path for us. Uh, and uh, the nice thing is, we are, one, we're familiar, and most of other colleges are too. And two, uh, there's always something interesting to learn and talk about regarding homeschool applicants. So enjoy the conversation this evening. That is true. I was actually saying that I think I'm going to learn a lot through this presentation this evening as well. And finally, last but not least, uh, Jim Washington is from Dartmouth College. Thank you. Uh, good evening, all. I'm very pleased, as Rob mentioned, to uh, have a chance really to get at a discussion. And I realize we don't very often in our, at least I don't very often in my work, get the luxury to sit around and just talk to admissions issues around the homeschool context. And so that's what I'm looking for tonight. I think it will be great to, to have that uh, focus. Um, I'm Director of Admissions for Strategic Initiatives at uh, Dartmouth College. I've been here <clears throat> for about 20 years. And before that, I hung out in a place near Rob. I was Director of Admissions at the U University of New Hampshire as well. So I have... Uh, two children who have been born in state. I'm about as New Hampshire as they come. <laughs> and we've been working a long time together, Jim. So, but we were saying we're, we're still very young, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and without further ado, let's get into our conversation for tonight. Um, I will warn everyone that 
Um, while I am very good at the college admission topics, I am not very good at technology. So advancing the screen on the PowerPoint somehow seems to be magically difficult for me. So bear with me as I go forward and backward a couple times through the presentation. Just know it's me um, making some mistakes behind the scenes. So <laughs> let's get started and get to the first slide here. All right. So one of the things we want to talk about that is really not different whether you're a homeschool student or whether you're a student who attends a public high school um, or a student who attends a private high school. Um, the high school transcript is a really important piece of that admission process. I would like to ask our panelists, what is the purpose of that high school transcript? Can we talk a little bit about that? And maybe let's start with Mercy first. There you go. Um, so the transcript is basically the whole picture of your academic experience during high school. Um, the transcript is where us as counselors, we have a chance to pretty much decipher what you did for the last four years. We'll be able to look at um, the specific courses that you have taken, where you have taken them, and the grades you have achieved in those courses. So the transcript is pretty much essential piece of your application and um, to I will say most academic institutions you choose to apply to. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about what that transcript we what we prefer it looks like but just keep in mind that the transcript is going to be your central piece of the college application um, when you submit it and it's important that you dedicate a lot of time to putting it together. Perfect and Robert Jim anything to add to that? Uh, sure. Uh, I think it can't be overstated how important the transcript is to any college admissions process. Uh, I think annually in surveys of admissions officers and admissions offices, uh, consistently the transcript is identified as the single most important piece of information that is considered, and mm -hmm. for good reason. Uh, the reasons that Mercy mentioned earlier. It's a summation of your academic experiences. So colleges are, are genuinely concerned and interested and understanding what is the nature of your academic experience as defined by the courses you've taken, uh, the patterns of experience you've had in those courses, uh, and to understand trends that you might have exhibited during your high school career. Uh, the, so the core question that any college admissions office is trying to answer before other subsequent questions are considered is, can the student be academically successful at the institution in question? And the transcript is proven from both experience and data and research to show that that is the most predictive tool that we have at our disposal for answering those questions. So it really is a central piece of our considerations. And I might uh, add on to Rob's comments. Uh, trans transcripts come in many designs and, and, and so forth. I'm seeing a, a question coming up about can it be more, more than one page? Sure. Um, but what we also spend a lot of our time um, uh, zeroing in and considering is um, strength of whatever curriculum was available to you. Um, so that's, it's not just about a class or a grade or a written summary of something of that nature. We wanna get a, a good handle also on, you know, how challenging has the work been? Absolutely. I think that to Jim's point, I think it's often maybe helpful for homeschooled families to appreciate is that in many instances, maybe not every instance, a student's always going to be evaluated within the context of their own high school environment. Right. So we're not going to be necessarily comparing a student from high school A to high school B or from homeschool situation one to high school C. Uh, we're looking at students within the context of their experience, because in most cases, Students don't get to choose where they go to high school. That's decided for them by their parents, by virtue of where they live, or any other number of circumstances. So to Jim's point, we really want to know how much you've taken advantage of the opportunities that are available to you within the context of your high school environment, whatever that happens to be. Perfect. And Jim did mention that it is okay for a transcript to be more than one page. I know a lot of times, and we're going to talk about letters of recommendation a little bit later in the in the evening, but a lot of times um, we get nervous, you know, is the format just one page? Is If I go over that one page, are you going to look at the second page? Um, so that is okay, especially in this situation, I would imagine it would be very different for these yeah. students. Perfect. All right. So for homeschooling parents, there's really a, a wide scope as far as what their child could possibly study and, and how their child could learn. 
um, are there particular course requirements or maybe even learning areas that an admission office is going to be looking for on a homeschool transcript? Or are there some you know, standard things that they really should have on that transcript as far as courses go? And let's start, oops, sorry, see that's me changing slides again. Let's start this one with Rob. Uh, sure, uh, I think the shorter answer is yes. There should be some very particular things experienced by the high school student during their high school years based on what their uh, expectations and aspirations might be. And typically those expectations for what we're looking for align very closely with what the faculty at our respective institutions are looking for. So for example, many colleges uh, will ask that students have math to a particular level and they also include specific courses or course content. Now, many high schools are going to deliver that content in different formats. They may not call it Algebra 1, Geometry, Algebra 2, or Pre-Calculus. They'll call it different things based on the math curriculum and the math faculty at that institution. So the title of the course is less relevant. Uh, but what is important is the content. And the faculty at colleges are teaching their classes and structuring their expectations on the assumption that students are bringing with them certain skill sets. So courses represent skill sets in our eyes. So we're looking for particular courses. And in, in the absence of those course titles, we're also looking for a demonstration that the student has a, learned and mastered certain skill sets. So the idea of competency-based transcripts becomes very important to colleges. Uh, so again, we are looking for very certain skills. And you have to be, as a parent or a student, you have to be aware of what the expectations are of each of the colleges you happen to be interested in. Or thinking from a different perspective, if you have an aspiration to be X professional, um, what kind of skill sets are going to be required of you to become that kind of professional? So if you want to be an accountant, uh, taking accounting courses in high school is not important. Uh, taking good math courses that serve as a good foundation for accounting courses in college is critically important. If you want to be a physician, uh, taking a good math and science courses during your high school years is important, but also equally as important as taking good humanities and social sciences and fine and performing arts. Uh, colleges expect high school students to be generalists. We don't expect you to specialize during your high school years. So don't neglect one subject area because it's not your favorite or you don't think it's important to your short term academic or professional aspirations. But again, take the role of a generalist very seriously. Take a broad range of courses during your high school years and don't neglect them year after year. Uh, colleges want to see four or five major courses every single year, not just in the first two years, but every single year. That's the best preparation you can have for a great college career. Perfect. And Jim, anything to go along with those lines? Right. Now, you'll hear me um, bring in the issue of context many times uh, over the evening. The context that uh, comes to mind for, for me is we're, we're representatives of liberal arts colleges. Um, and so we're looking for some foundation pieces that we know whichever direction you go and as you really kind of hone in on what you're really interested in as an undergraduate and whether you want to be a dual major or whatever, we're looking for you to have a relatively kind of uh, small but very sturdy base. And, and Rob walked you through those, those academic areas, the math, you know, the social science, obviously uh, English language, um, but that really is, is so critical because where you find a lot of our um, uh, introductory courses begin at, at the colleges, they begin with an assumption that you have at least um, achieved well in many of those courses. So if you think about it, it's the transcript is incredibly important telling us what you have um, decided to take along the way, but you also heard a transcript is the one piece that many of us feel right now is, um, uh, well, I think the, the better predictor of uh, performance for your first year of college. Exactly. Mercy, anything to add? Um, I just wanted to add as well, and I think something important to highlight, is that every school is going to be looking at different courses and different requirements um, for admission. They will be looking at, um, you know, your transcript, and they may be they may have certain requirements in mind as they're evaluating your application. Um, I think that it's important to remind everyone that we're here as resources, as admission counselors. And if you have any question about the type of courses that your students should take, um, if there's anything that you have any question about, whether this class is more beneficial 
to them or the other. Um, this is what we're here for. We're usually able to um, not necessarily tell you which course will be the best for every school, uh, but we can definitely tell you which courses will um, make a difference at the time that the student is applying to our institution. So always remember that if you have a question, that's part of our role within admission offices and that every school has different requirements and different specific courses that they're looking for or looking to see on a transcript but that it is our role and our job to be able to give you a good idea what is a good option um, in terms of courses for your transcript yeah perfect great point i think that's one of the themes that we might hear a couple times tonight um, is that it is okay to contact um, your admission counselor you know at the different colleges and, and you may not have decided which college your student you know your student may not have decided which college he or she wishes to attend um, and that's okay you know it's okay to ask those questions even if you don't end up applying to that particular institution um, those counselors are there to really um, to answer those questions and to help you through the process so um, definitely reach out as you move along but you'll hear that again as we move through the night for sure all right let's move on to the next one oh, let me make sure i didn't miss something here um, all right so if um if a student is doing doing some experimental learn or experiential learning um, and not necessarily enrolling in you know a particular course, how is that going to be able to show up on the transcript? What might that look like for for a family in general? And let's start with Jim on this one. Okay. Um... It's a great question, um, and I and there's no single one. You're right. You're not right, um, because again, it's a matter of of um, context, uh, but it's also um, a matter of uh, what are the range of experiential learning components that you you want to convey to us, and um, I would say that particularly those for a you know a school like Dartmouth, I would even say certainly the University of New Hampshire, if you're doing things um, that show your your intellectual interests, you know, it, I don't want you to be thinking in a box of what's well, a required course for undergraduates for me to get into a college or whatever. You have those, you know, you you will be deliberate in taking those, but you may have some other things that you know just have really fascinated you, like. Um, you got to know someone uh, in a um, in a uh, local um, you know high tech company, and uh, you know they had a summer opportunity for students to come in and and uh, learn something about the company, but also that the work they they do. And then before you know it, you're going, wow, that is I didn't know all this before. I really like that. I like that experience. So you may pursue that further. And so the, 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 we don't want to not have that part of your intellectual engagement off radar. We want to make sure that you have a chance to convey to us where, what, how, maybe even why. And um, not, I think it's not a bad idea, particularly if you're um, you have a mentor at that what is our mythical high tech right now. If that person would be available to just kind of put a few words together that puts it in context, okay? Because it could that's another place where it could really uh, something really important could be missed because you're working in there and you're just you know you're you've, you've got professionals who are turning to you to ask you questions on how they can do their jobs better and i've seen that I've, I've seen that happen before and and so it's nice when uh someone who is uh uh a mentor is able to share a few lines and say yes here's what 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 was covered but also this was a student who was working at what label whatever label we wouldn't we wouldn't we don't typically see high school students being able to work at this label. Why is that important? Well, it, it's again the issue of rigor, the uh, uh, the issue of your reaching out um, and running with your intellectual interest. Perfect. And Mercy, anything to add to that? 
Uh, sure. I think uh, Jim's point are really, uh, really strong and important points. Um, I would add a few other points of interest to think about, and this probably isn't a universal statement, but I think it's one that, to take into serious consideration. Experiential learning is a wonderful and very important thing. And I think students who engage in experiential learning during their high school years are developing behaviors and um, processes of learning that are going to put them in very good standing when they get to college. Because when you get to college, the opportunities are often are given to students who are showing initiative. And students who are choosing experiential learning are showing a lot of initiative. The one caution I'd put out there is uh, to be careful and thoughtful about which courses you take for your experiential learning. Um, there's different schools of thought about this, and I uh, admit I have my own bias on this, but I think students need to be looking at experiential learning as a supplement to the core courses. They shouldn't replace the core courses. Um, so we want to be very careful that you are taking a full curriculum in Algebra 2, for example, so that you're prepared for the next level of math that might be expected of you. Uh, the risk is if you do uh, Algebra 2 on an experiential learning basis, you may not cover the full curriculum as expected of you, and that might put you at a competitive academic disadvantage, which we don't want to do. Uh, so again, I think experiential learning is a great and wonderful thing and should be encouraged for as many students as possible, uh, and all, for all the reasons that Jim mentioned. They're just fabulous experiences that help you understand what you're, what's important to you and what you like. But again, keep in mind the relative balance of what you're supposed to be doing in high school, developing core academic skills. Perfect. And you know what I did miss on um, one of the earlier slides, I do want to kind of go back just a step. Um, one of the questions I missed is what are the elements a transcript must include? What things should be on every transcript for a fan, for a student? And let's start with Mercy on this one. It's a really good question. Um, I think that when it comes to a transcript, more is more. You definitely want as much detail as you can on that transcript. Um, I think the cleaner, simpler version for me is a transcript that lists every class by year and maybe um, specifies which semester it was taken. Um, it offers context on how the transcript went or how the course was completed, if it was a course online, if it was taken, it was taken in a co-op, if it was a college course. Um, I would love to see the grade as well, um, if that's available. Um, but I think the best format, again, is having a clear, it's, it's having a clear year by year outline of what the student, um, the class the student has taken. Um, I will say that the transcript that it makes our job a lot easier if we're able to see it in that specific context. Um, and I put a lot of emphasis as well on making sure that I know how that course up was completed. If you completed a course on VLAX, make sure that you add um, a role there where you can mention that it was taken in that format. Or if you take took a class at a community college or another type of college, please add it as well. Um, and I will tell you that that's going to prevent us from asking any more questions or maybe giving you a call for an explanation. Um, usually, um, one of the reasons why at my institution we require interviews uh, for students is not necessarily because we we want yes we want to know more about you but it's also an excellent opportunity for you to explain your transcript to us so when we do get to see the transcript it makes a lot more sense to us but again the clearer you can make it the more specific you can make it the more you can add when it comes to the details of each course the easier it will be for us to evaluate it that makes sense anything to add to that rob or jim uh, sure i think I just i would echo what's been said but does may add a few more clarifying statements uh, the homeschool transcript is looked at no differently than a, a, a transcript coming from another school district. So it's very important that you follow the protocols and guidance uh, methods, methodology used by school, different school districts. I think it's been mentioned earlier, high school transcripts look different from high school to high school. So there's nothing wrong with it being different. Uh, but there are common elements that are certainly required. I'd also add there, if, you're, if your homeschool program is being managed or supported by a third party organization it's helpful to identify what that third party organization is and any any web links or any context that might be helpful for us as we learn to interpret that uh, as mercy pointed out i think identifying what the source of the course is if a student is taking courses from multiple organizations as part of their high school experience um, and then who's doing the teaching um, and again is there 
uh, mm -hmm. again, is it mom and dad? Is it aunt and uncle? Is it some other individual? That gives us helpful context to understand what's being accomplished and who's helping drive the process. Yep. Wonderful. Anything else, Jim, for that? I think Rob hit it. Perfect. <laughs> Guess way of doing that. <laughs> we we have a question. We didn't we didn't quite cover it yet. But how could a family have the transcript reflect the rigor of the students' classes if it's not labeled like an honors or an AP or or a clearly a, a dual enrolled class that would be with, at a college? How could a family indicate? just the the right difficulty level that the student really was working at for a particular course that's a wonderful question jim do you want to start that one? Oh, mercy sure. raise the I'm, hand <laughs> no go ahead marcy I'll, I'll jump in after you um i was just going to add something that i was going to say previously is that at least for us um at saney something that we put a lot of emphasis on for homeschool applicants is the counselor letter which in this case is usually submitted by whoever the primary educator or usually the parent is for um, the student. And this is where a lot of the families really go in depth about um, you know, describing the specific courses or the specific curriculum that a student follows. Um, student and family there can really be, um, give us plenty of detail about the type of assignments, the type of content that the student completed in the specific courses. And I think that that's, that is a resource that is often overlooked, but it's definitely one of those um, parts of the application that we go back to as we are reading the transcript, as we are analyzing what the student has done. Um, and I think that's probably one of the best places where you can add specific de details about the rigor of the classes that the student has taken. Perfect. Next yeah, one, go ahead. I was just going to run. Um, it, the, the homeschool student um, shouldn't have to work really hard to help us understand a course that's been taken at, at some educational institution as, as a blend into their, uh, you know, their, their particular um, carefully shaped college transcript. And I think if you just think for a while about um, how would I know, how might you know that taking this course was a challenging course. So I'll use a, a community college course. How would you know? Well, there are a whole bunch of things you could, could do. Um, how many people were in the class? You know, who was, again, who was the teacher? Who was teaching the course? Did they have um, sections that were um, set by ability levels? And so I just want you to kind of start to think in a few areas in that way because i think then it will say to you ah we not only need to get if it was a course taken for a grade a grade or a credit i'm not assuming they're both the same it provides a little bit more i'm sorry i'm going to say it again context <laughs> okay um so i this is an area i think we could talk about for quite a while maybe we can double back to it if if you know at, at some point but um, there are so many ways that um, even being at the helm of your own uh, educational experience, uh, you know, prior to reaching college, you know, there are actually a fair number of ways that you can very um, succinctly let us know, clue us in to um, the rigor. Now, one of the things for students who are not um, homeschooled, I'm going to I'm going to pick a uh, just a fictional uh high school out of florida now it's fictitious but i the reason I'm, I'm choosing it is because it goes back to the can a transcript be more than a page i think they start somewhere around sixth or seventh grade or whatever and yep. it's just it pages and pages and pages you're trying to get things lined up was it a semester was it a third was it whatever uh and yet, what helps is there's an additional little thing that comes with that very often, which is the high school profile. And this is where it's not always the easiest for homeschool students if you have multiple pieces, um, some which were taken in a 
you know, kind of a more, uh, I guess I, I just would call it a traditional sense, um, where the reporting factor it can give really good insight as to, wow, was that a, was that a challenging course? You bet it was a challenging course. How do we how do we show that? You show it again by making sure we can see whenever possible, we can see you in some kind of comparison to the other bright people who were doing that particular study with you. Tim, anything different at the University of New Hampshire? Uh, sure. Yeah, this is a good, very good question and a very it's actually a very challenging one to answer mm -hmm. uh, succinctly uh, because there's a lot of variables. But I think what well, the starting point for me would be this is where the parent or the person in charge of the the education has got to an, ask some questions of themselves and of the the program their their young person's involved with. So, what defines challenging? Um, so to say that I'm in a challenging program of study is one thing. To prove it is is an entirely different thing. Uh, so thought has to be given to that. So how how is the program of study different from what a typical, um, whatever typical happens to mean, a program of study might deliver and offer? And a couple of areas to think about. Uh, one would be the, the content, how much content is being covered. Uh, more content doesn't always equate to more rigor, but sometimes it does. Um, what kind of skill sets are being expected of a student in this classroom, ex this class experience? What levels of critical thinking? Uh, what level of analysis are going to be asked of the student in this process? So again, it raises more questions. So how do you evaluate class uh, critical thinking? How do you evaluate analytical thinking and all those sorts of things? So a lot of thought is required of the, the in this case, I'm sorry, the parents who are going to have to sit down and define uh, for the benefit of others, uh, what is the standard being utilized in this, this context? Uh, some of the points that uh, Jim and Mercy were pointing out are good points of reference. So if you're in a running start course, as course, um, a commonly accepted definition, but maybe not a universally accurate one, is that those courses are going to be more rigorous than any high school course. Mm -hmm. Often the case, but not always, um, because not all college courses are created equal. Um, so you have to be um, somewhat uh, apply a critical eye towards this topic and really maybe have some good conversation with colleagues, peers, other people in the world who are involved with home, homeschooling education to come up with a good answer that's going to be easily understood. And the other thing that Jim mentioned earlier, and so did Mercy, is the idea of having a lot of information available for colleges, uh, particularly for this application process. The benefit of a traditional high school environment is we have a lot of data available about those high schools and about that experience, both from the point of view of what the high school provides. They provide a very detailed listing of courses, typically provide a great detail of outcomes, what happens to their students, where they go, how successful they are. Um, that's typically lacking in a homeschool class of one. Um, there's not a whole lot of history or context for us to draw from and to make informed judgments about. Um, so we don't know what Johnny's 27 prior students in that homeschool environment did because there aren't 27 prior experiences. Uh, so that's where the challenge comes in. So that's why I think it's a lot of, a lot of conversation is required by the homeschool parents, administrators, whatever their title wants to be, uh, to figure out how to how to articulate rigor, challenge, level of difficulty to uh, colleges. And particularly in this day and age, when an increasing number of schools are test optional, so you don't have that third point of reference that quote unquote is objective, and I, I would put in there a little editorial comment, standardized testing is never objective. But uh, it is a measure that we can all refer to uh, to, to sort of balance out our judgments of what the student is doing in their homeschool classroom. Now, the last thing I'll say about this, I don't want people getting anxious or nervous. Not having standardized testing is not a big deal. Um, it really isn't. Um, it does not drive the conversation. It does not drive decisions. And I think what we're going to learn this year with so many schools going test optional is that we're all going to survive perfectly well without having any standardized tests. Yeah, I think that's a great thing to to talk about just a little bit. I had it kind of later slide, but kind of now that we're on the topic, um, I've listened to a lot of webinars um, this summer with admission representatives and, and actually read admission files myself for a college in Boston. And one of the, the things, you know, one of the biggest questions we get in our office from students right now is, you know, 
how am I going to take my test? How am I going to present SATs to schools? I, the test dates are not available, or if they are available, there's not enough seating for me to get a seat in those testing dates. What will happen? Um, I think the overwhelming um, conversation is that for the majority of schools, we're finding that um, at least for this admission cycle, schools that were not test optional will be test optional. Um, and you know, so for most of our students, that's not going to be an issue. Um, I think it will be very interesting to see what happens going forward with SATs and, and ACTs and, and how that's going to play a role. Yeah, Michelle. Before we move on to some of the other topics in the presentation, we have a, a little bit more on the transcript. Another Absolutely. question. Oh, no, I'm not moving on. We got plenty. Oh, good. Yeah, good. Give okay. me some questions now. <laughs> so uh, another parent re asked about including either a book list that the student reads or the sorts of textbooks that the family may have used as their course material. Is that help additional information that would be helpful to include on the transcript? Uh, I'll jump in. I would say uh, potentially uh, very useful. Um, and kind of flip the process a little bit. At college, when you're taking a course from a, a professor, um, what's the first thing you're looking at at the beginning of that course? It's called a syllabus. And what does the syllabus do? Well, it gives you a sense of the objectives, um, how your um, work will be graded, um, how many meetings of the class it will be. But then typically you also see a list of the readings right away. Okay. And and so that there's a there's a um, there's a, a reasonable um, uh, bit of connection, but you, I'm just trying to present it so that you think a different way about what's already out there and how some some folks are dealing with sharing that information. So I would say um, if, if, if one of the reasons it's helpful to keep track of what's going on from year to year is you don't want to have to go be at a point where you go, oh, gee, now do we use that book or that book or whatever? Try to stay on top of um, those uh, pieces of, uh, of the intellectual life so that you're not at a point where under pressure, under pressure of application or whatever, you're trying to go back and, and, and really rethink in which order you took books and so forth. So I, I appreciate it when I see what's, what students are reading. Um, and, and so that's where I'm coming at this from. Rapper Mercy? No. You think that's a good one? Yep. I, I think it sounds like a, a really great idea because as, you know, as Jim was saying, that's certainly where um, we know what's happening in a college level course. So um, having that type of information and one of the things that I think Michelle and I would um, would emphasize even towards the end of the presentation is really keeping an, a really good system of organization as you go along, really from the eighth grade on, because some of that work, you know, we know that some of our students in the public school, my daughter, for instance, had two high school credits moving up to high school from eighth grade. Um, your students may have that as well. Um, so keeping track of what your student has really done from eighth grade on um, in some type of organized fashion. These days it could be digital, it could be, you know, so like me, it could be by hand, it could be whatever way works for you. It could be in a beautiful color-coded file system, or it could be in a stack, you know, in the corner of the room. Whatever you want to do, um, whatever works for you. But I think, you know, keeping some type of an organizational system so that if a college does have a question, um, you have it all right there and you're able to provide that information then um, for them in the evaluation process. So the more information, um, the better in this process, I think, is definitely what we're, we're really saying to you as we go along. All right, so let me scoop back to where we were before I remembered that I wanted to tell you about what would actually go on to those transcripts. And I think we started to really address one of these questions. Um, if a student, Mercy talked about this actually, if a student takes courses in different areas, you know, maybe you take a couple courses through VLAC and you take a course at the community, local community college, you have some parent directed homeschooling courses, maybe even you took a course at the public high school, whatever it may be, 
those are really different learning platforms and how do we get that all in one transcript? Mercy spoke about, you know, just indicating somewhere on that transcript that this was a VLAX course, that this was from NHTI or whichever community college. Um, but also, is there a need for a, a family to then maybe get a transcript from that community college sent to um, the intended college or maybe from VLAX? Would we go about getting those pieces? to be sent to you as well? Is that is that part of the process? Maybe starting with Mercy, you wanna start? Um, that's a great question. I think it will depend a little bit from school to school. Um, for myself, if I'm reading a transcript, sometimes I do see official transcripts from universities and colleges. Um, but as I'm evaluating a transcript, um, it may be the unofficial transcript from VLAX or the unofficial transcript from some of um, the community colleges and the colleges that the student has taken courses in but be aware that universities will require official copies if you were to enroll at that particular institution and um, so, so for myself as any of some college we don't necessarily require the official version when you are applying but be aware that we will ask for them if you were to enroll um, at our institution but um, Something I will say, if you have the ability of obtaining the official copies early on in the process, if it's not a course that you're currently taking, um, I will suggest that you get it, you send it to us, um, and we'll make sure to transfer that information to the registrar's office if you were to enroll. Any other comments, Robert, Jim, with that one? I'm all set. Perfect, makes sense. Excellent. I, I, I was actually just gonna add one thing. Yeah. Uh, students, um, you can always receive or request a copy of your grade in any particular, you know, course um, for your purposes. That, if you think about it, you own that. The the um, the confirming fact that we're receiving is from, you know, a community college registrar or wherever it may be. And so that's what we, that's how we keep track of what has arrived in a student's file that's making it complete versus what has, uh, was self-presented. Hope I didn't confuse people on that. And Mercy? That's an excellent point. Um, especially as I'm thinking when I'm bringing an application and I may have already evaluated the application and hey, surprise, this is a surprise transcript from um, a college or a community college um, that comes in a little bit late in the process. So this goes back to the point of making sure they include all of your classes, even the ones that you're currently taking on your transcript. So we know what to expect. Um, and when we know that all um, materials for that application have been received. Absolutely. That's a great point. Um, when college admission counselors are evaluating files, you know, some of our students are applying in an early action um, process for some schools, early decision. Um, and some schools, some schools, some students are going to be applying, you know, maybe regular decision a little bit later in the process. So they may have first quarter senior grades at that point um, that they are presenting. But our early students, may not. So students don't forget to include that information. What am I taking in the first semester, but also what am I taking second semester so that the colleges understand what, how you're continuing with your senior year and that you're not getting senioritis too terribly early, that you're going to follow through and you're going to take all of those required courses um, before you enroll in the college because, um, you know, anybody working on a college campus knows that that semester is very important um, in terms of your preparedness when you get there as a college freshman. So um, they're going to want to have that information. So don't forget to present that um, to your intended colleges as well. That's a great point. Um, let me scoot ahead just a little bit. Um, here's a question that we get asked quite a bit, um, not necessarily just in a homeschool type of situation, but even now with COVID-19, um, some of our public school students, you know, maybe their classes went to a pass-fail grading system, um, but for our homeschool students, they're not going to have a grade point average necessarily, or certainly not a class rank. Um, you would be one of one, which is delightful. You can be the valedictorian of your class um, of one, but how do colleges take that information, and how are students evaluated perhaps for um, admission, but also for scholarship purposes? And Rob, do you want to start that one? Uh, sure. 
Uh, a couple of thoughts. Uh, first is that how colleges award merit scholarships is going to vary widely from school to school. Uh, so you can't assume what I'm about to share is going to be a consistent or constant process across the country, because it won't be. Uh, but that said, there's a few other things that I think are important to know. And uh, for example, uh, you're, if a student is homeschooled and they are, as, as, as Karen indicated, a, a class of one, um, class rank doesn't have a whole lot of meaning. But increasingly, class rank has relatively little meaning across this country uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that a increasingly large number of schools are no longer offering class rank. So at UNH, for example, uh, we enroll about 2,700 first-year students, and probably about 45 to 50 percent of those students come from high schools that do not offer a class rank. So increasingly, it's near the majority. In many schools, it is the majority. Um, so I don't think class rank has any great value any longer in this day and age. Uh, GPA, though, does have meaning, I think, uh, and we do try to normalize GPA within the context of a high school. Uh, by recalculating GPAs and just using core courses that are we think are most relevant to predicting a student's success. So we may, in fact, recalculate a GPA of a homeschooled student just to look at those core courses, English, Math, Science, Social Science, and Foreign Languages. And that's very helpful to us. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that when colleges are looking at uh, awarding merit scholarships, they're looking at awarding merit scholarships typically, but not always, within the context of their admitted student population and they want to award a merit scholarship to those students who exhibit merit or are substantially above the norm relative to the, the rest of the admitted population. Um, so as an example, and UNH typically um, will award a merit scholarship to students roughly the top third uh, of our entering class. Uh, and we make those determinations typically by using GPA. Um, so GPA is going to be a pretty good indicator of who's going to be eligible for a merit scholarship. So a student who's homeschooled will have a GPA typically of some kind. Uh, maybe if, if it is a, one of the true exceptions, that is a student coming from a narrative-based academic environment only, which is offering again, written evaluations as opposed to numerical or letter evaluations of a student's performance, uh, that student will, ha will, will have to make other interpretations uh, based on the context of what we know about the experience and uh, passing judgment on what we read based to award that merit scholarship. Short of it is, or some of it is, uh, homeschool students are not at a disadvantage, in my opinion, for receiving merit scholarships. Great. And Jim or Mercy, anything to add to that? That's a great explanation. Yeah, that is excellent. That makes a lot of sense. And I think, you know, I think the thing that we also have to think about is there are all kinds of different transcripts coming into an admission office, not just a homeschool transcript versus a public school transcript. You know, even within the public schools, we're seeing very different transcripts from all these schools. You know, one grading system may be based on a 4.0 and one may be based on a 10.0. So there's a lot of adjustments that need to be made within the admission context for us to be able to evaluate those transcripts. And that is all done um, within that office. Michelle, go ahead. Another follow-up question related to this. So does it help or aid uh, if a homeschool family uses accredited programs uh, or you know, to some greater or lesser degree so that there's more substance and structure to that transcript when you see it and less of this undefined, uh, more nebulous kind of thing and especially it, and that kind of piggybacks right back to what we just said about uh, GPA should the parents be assigning grades does that help so it's you know trying to again show the rigor of whatever the student is achieving during their high school years Marcy would you like to take that one yes um, I will say it's a tricky question um, especially because there are so many services that are available for families to take advantage of um, when they are, um, you know, assign, thinking of courses for um, for their children. So I think I'll leave it to the family's discretion what they think is best. Um, you can certainly teach a class and we can certainly you give you credit for it. Um, you can certainly go to a public school, VLAC, anything along, the, along those lines. But, you know, that is a serious commitment that you take on as a family. Um, and as an institution, I think it's really up to the parents to decide what would be best for their student. Um, know that we're not going to look at your course any differently because it was taken at home or um, 
through one of the through natural these services. Um, so definitely, I think it's up to the families to take this decision. Um, you have to do what what works best for you, for your student, for your family. Um, so I would say to keep that in mind. And again, that's more of a personal uh, opinion. Um, I'm not sure if any of my other panelists would like to share theirs as well. Jim or Rob, any different from that? I thought that was well stated. Um, it, it is not our, I don't think it's um, our position to uh, manipulate uh, any student into a format, particularly if it's just because we think it will be easier for us to, to work our way through it. I think this is one of, um, you know, kind of what was the genesis of the decision to go homeschooling in the first place, and what were some of the components that were, were considered? You know, really, this is this is really pretty serious for us. We want to make sure we keep these four, five, six, whatever it may be. We want to keep these things in 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 mind. They're the spine, they're the soul and the spine of why we're doing this whole thing in the first place. So it would be not helpful for, at all for us to arbitrarily try to send you off to an accredited program that may not then align with your three, four, five, whatever it is. It's a great way to think about it. I appreciate that viewpoint. Thank you so much. Michelle, were there any other questions that we should make sure we answer at this point? Okay, perfect. Let me scoot ahead here and you see know, what- I'm gonna, say, I'm gonna say one thing that I, I didn't yeah. make any comment on on that prior slide. And I think the question was, how are students evaluated for admission? I talked about scholarship, uh, but a very broad and I hope accurate statement is that homeschooling students are evaluated for admissions in the same way as every other student applies to our institution. There's no difference there. They need to meet the same expectations, and these expectations are in place to ensure that the students can be successful. Um, and again, what we're evaluating is course content, skill sets, ability to prosper and thrive in our respective environments. Uh, so the, answering those questions is the same as the same goal. Methodology may be different because the student may present the information regarding their educational experience in a slightly different way as we've been discussing. Uh, but the basic concepts and basic uh, assumptions about how we're going to approach the question, can the student be successful at our institution, remains the same. I think that's a perfect point. Rob, I think it is really important for our families that are listening um, to understand that this process is the same. You know, whether you're an international student, whether you're a homeschooling student, whether you're a, a student that went to public school or you went to private school for a time, whatever it may be, um, that re the process of admission is that just as Rob said, is to admit students um, and to use the information that is there in front of us to be able to do that. And again, I think this is where I'm going to go back to the idea that if you know we're sitting and evaluating a file and we're not sure of some information or we're not sure it's complete that's when you know one of our counselors here is going to reach out to the parent if that's the you know primary educator and just say can you explain this a little bit more to me so in this math that you have here you know is this algebra 1 is this algebra 2 based is this you know are these concepts included so that they have a better idea of evaluating that student? So, um, you know, always reach out and, and get that assistance. Thanks for that, Rob. I appreciate that. All right. So let's talk a little bit. Um, I did mention COVID-19 and, you know, here we are. Karen, all of us. Yes, quick question. Got to jump in. Sorry, a few more came in okay, just okay. before we transition. Uh, and sorry about that. Uh, we, have, we have a parent concerned, again, just want to reiterate are they better assigning grades or having that more narrative description of the student uh you mentioned somewhere in the earlier part of the talk about the guidance counselor recommendation or school profile helping to explain the rigor of the student's work so is there is there a preferred way to explain what the student has achieved whether it's the some sort of way of assigning grades, the school profile type of component, guidance counselor recommendation that may come from the parent. Um, is there a way to do that? And then before we go on, I have another question that came uh -huh. in. All right, does anybody 
want to field that particular one. Anybody want to start? About concerning if parents should really consider assigning a grade, would that make more sense or is it okay if it's a, a different way of, of evaluating students? Uh, I would, I'll jump in with a, maybe a simple answer and maybe not the complete answer, but the simple answer is a grade would be helpful. Uh, and again, I say that for a couple of reasons. One is uh, within the context of the homeschool experience and assuming that the philosophical underpinning for the homeschool experience is not an avoidance of the absolute measures of grades and what they represent, uh, but rather maybe more educational philosophies, maybe more the motivator. But grades are helpful. Um, again, in our world, in our way of evaluating and learning, grades represent an accomplishments, they represent skill sets achieved, they represent knowledge learned. Uh, and again, properly utilized, they can be very helpful. Um, again, if there's less value or not, or the value of the grade is not tethered to the learning and the content of comp mastered, then they become less, less helpful to us. There's also a operational uh, expediency to it as well. Um, if we're reading 20,000 plus applications, um, it's frankly hard um, to be able to churn through lots of pages of narrative and make a deter an objective determination, as objective as it can be, an inherently subjective process, uh, to make a determination about that student's readiness for college level work. So. Uh, there is a certain familiarity uh, that we all have with grades, and I think that lends itself to asking for grades in this process. Um, that being said, uh, there are other ways to get at the subtleties of the educational experience that a homeschool student might have, and some schools will have different measures of, of, of exhibiting accomplishments or different kinds of accomplishments. So you can measure the overall grade, you can have um, competencies that are relevant to the subject matter at hand that can be evaluated and there can be multiple competencies that might be worth noting for a particular subject area and the, the homeschool parent has the discretion to be able to identify what they are. Uh, so there's lots of other possibilities but a summary grade is, is most helpful from, in my opinion. Okay a parent had a follow-up to that is if the parent if grade is assigned by the parent how do they make help it appear present as objective instead of uh, just mom's grade because I love you. <laughs> you know, how do you know it's, it's got real substance behind that grade? That's a yeah, magic okay. question. Your question. <laughs> good one, actually. I actually really like that question. That's why I can never do a homeschool when I my kids. My kids are wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> well, there are days, though, that you might want to give them that F, Rob. I don't know. I have teens right now. So. <laughs> There are days. <laughs> so how is that? That is a really fair question. So, you know, in, in terms of mom being my educator, you know, how is that? How can they make that, you know, objective? So if the student truly is an all A student, does that feel objective to the parent? You know, um, Rob or Jim or Mercy, what do you think about that? Well, we, we, we hope, I'll just give a very brief answer. We hope that the parents who are doing the grading are, are being objective um, and they're setting aside their parental love and affection for their child uh, in the moment of assigning a grade. That's what we hope and expect. Uh, okay. I'll leave it there. So that there should be some other things that add to that description that substantiate a wording, whatever that grade is, something. And I would imagine, too, that, you know, if I'm a homeschool parent, I may have some set of a rubric or some set of parameters around which I'm going to grade kind of each of those courses that my child might be in. Um, so that if Jim or Rob or, or Mercy says, so how, you know, how did you evaluate your student? I'm going to say, well, this is the rubric um, that they had to meet for, for the assignments. And this is kind of how I use that. Um, so I think that, you know, Again, the admission process is is one where you know those those evaluations are very helpful. Um, but also, I think you know, as parents, we do want to be fairly objective because if a student is applying to St. Anselm or UNH or, or Dartmouth, um, we do want them to be successful once they get there. So you know, any type of grade inflating, whether it's at home or whether it's in a high school setting, isn't necessarily helping our students in the end because they may get there and find themselves not as prepared 
um, for what they need to be doing going forward as maybe some of their classmates might be. So, um, so I'm, I'm guessing that most of our homeschooling parents are doing this for the reason, for really great reasons, and, and they're probably going to be pretty good at doing that, you know, set aside a rubric, have something to, to kind of fall back on, and I think they'll be in great shape for sure. Okay, right. so yeah, as part ahead. of, so as part of that transcript, if, mm -hmm. is it helpful to provide essays or work samples, or in the case of a performance major of some sort, include uh, a sample of what they've done, whether it's art or music or theater or something, are there other documents to go along with that application? Uh, you know, science experiments that they may have done, whatever it may be, does that additional documentation help provide that bigger picture into their homeschool program? Start with Jim, maybe for this one. Did you call me? I'm sorry, Jim, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you said it was so quietly. Yeah, I'm being um, quiet. <laughs> That's unusual for me. <laughs> so really, I just want to boil down one more time. The question at its at its essence is, Michelle. Did you is it helpful for a family to provide additional documentation such as essays or work samples? to help round out that transcript to show what the child has achieved? One of the reasons it's, um, I anticipated this would be an enjoyable night um, and hopefully a, a helpful uh, night for our audience is um, the number of times in which we're going to say there's not a huge difference, meaning looking at homeschoolers in a certain way and other people in our pool in another way. So for instance, many, many of the students who applied to Dartmouth, they really want to engage in, in the arts, uh, music, uh, voice. Well, many people, many students do submit, you know, something whether it was an outtake from, you know, a, a major concert that was done or something of that nat nat uh, nature. You need to look into our applications and see whether they're what required or recommended. Because in the required situation, those are going to our actual faculty. Um, and they know what they need in the in the voice section. You know, it's you know, it's you know, it's it's more complicated than two tenors and, and whatever. But they know what is at the level of um, what they're working with in the moment. Uh, and so I think in this case, I would be suggesting, uh, of course, you know. Now, it's also important to say we shouldn't um, go too wild in terms of building the size of this application file. Um, six years ago, I think it was six or seven years ago, um, we had a, a file come in from Colorado and there was so much annotation and so forth. If you took one of those, like the big heavy size, you know, kind of binders that have little clips in it, it was like a, a big sandwich. <laughs> it was, you know, yeah. and we're going, wait a minute. <laughs> because, and the, why do I go to the extreme? Uh, because some of our students go to extreme. And you have to keep in mind, we're looking for the essential. We're looking for the essential. And as long as you think it's essential, fine. But if it's padding, it's wasted effort. You know, if, you've, if we already know from some direction that, uh, you know, someone's spoken, somebody submitted a letter of recommendation. Uh, let's say in this case, it was uh, because a student uh, participated in, uh, you know, kind of community theater or whatever it was. Well, then you don't need to, you know, capture each of the theater programs for each event and so forth and send them on to us. I think we need to uh, uh, kind of make sure there's a understanding of a balance of our jobs because we, and we'll probably talk even more about holistic, but we want to make sure we're working with all component parts and not just kind of 
zeroing in on one one thing and making that a make or break. So not just GPA alone or, or, or so forth. But uh, I know Rob, I think mentioned 28,000 or so, you know, applications. We're probably around 22, 23. And if you think about it, uh, those decisions, so for us, early decision is begins November 1. By the time we get the files kind of in the shape where readers are ready, it's probably about the second, uh, second week or so of uh, November. And then we're into what? December, which is when, usually during the first week or so, those decisions and their financial aid decisions need to be going out, going out. Now, fortunately, we have a much smaller proportion of students who are dealing with in the early rounds. But we then only have from January 1 for the regular, regular admission deadline to really March, okay, um, to process 20 to 23,000 applications, somewhere in that, that range. Um, and I'll break it down further. I, I, I've said this at every panel I've been to. I say, I'm a slow reader, and I am. It's because I get so caught up in the holistic side of things. Um, but it, there are times when we have to buzz along and I make the choice that if it means it's gonna be a longer night for me because I had to make sure I really understood something, fine. But if every one of those files I had to touch really needed a lot of, you know, kind of sorting out because there was just stacks and stacks and stacks of things, you know, and particularly if it was stacks of things that didn't add new information, um, that's going to become a challenge for us because uh, first read of an application uh, probably is in the range of 10 minutes, somewhere around there. And if you think of the scale of what we're talking about, we're talking about the scale of you know eighth grade and tests and this and that, and then you're going to present this to some people who care about you. Uh, but they're very skilled. They've been trained in a way to get out the essence, okay? And not final decisions are made on each one of those. So, you know, an application may be read several times by other um, staff members, other colleagues. But, you know, you think of it, my goodness, uh, 10 minutes for that first read, it's striking. Now, I'm sure there are parents out there somehow, somewhere behind the panels who, say, well, that makes sense because uh, look at what a resume does when I've been working all my life in these various jobs and, you know, how long are folks spending there? They're going to be trying to get to the, to the essential. So I'm saying, you know, we need to help each other here. You know, we need to take the, our job seriously. But I think it's really important to have partners, and I'm talking about the whole homeschool educator or educators um, who can put us in a situation where we can do our job well in a timely sense to help the student. I think that makes a lot of sense too. I think um, the idea is, is that all of our students are applying for admission, whether they're homeschooled or not, you know, things like performing arts, there might be some additional pieces that they have to do, including an audition, honestly, which is something they would do on the campus. Um, but those pieces are gonna be sent to the faculty. So that's ne not necessarily coming to admissions. Um, but understanding what that college is looking for, I think is gonna be what's really important. So some colleges may say, you know what, I want that information to come into me here. And other campuses are gonna say, well, this is what we're limited to. And you'll notice on Common App students um, or parents, when your students start to fill out the Common Application, that um, there are certain spaces for these types of things to be put in there. So um, be aware of that. And you're, you might be limited to a certain number of letters of recommendation. Um, from certain schools. So mm -hmm. kind of keep track of that information and understand that that's, you know, in order to process everything, that that's kind of one of the things that they're looking for, which is good. All right, so I'm gonna keep us moving here to make sure that we get some of these questions answered before we close out for the night. Um, but one of the questions that um, I think some of our listeners might be interested in is, if a student is thinking about playing an NCAA Division One or Division Two sport in college, 
will a homeschool transcript actually be sufficient to meet the eligibility requirements? And maybe we can start with, let's start with Rob, you have a division one school. Well, I, I, I plead a level of ignorance here. Uh, I don't know the inter intricacies of the NCAA organization because they have a reputation and a notoriety of being incredibly rule bound. And so I don't know all the rules. That said, um, I have never uh, encountered a prospective student athlete who has been precluded from consideration for Division I sports because of the high school they went to. And I've seen them come from a variety of high schools, some, some not regionally accredited. And accreditation in high school and college worlds means an awful lot because it's essentially a license to operate and it's a, a representative vetting process that suggests to colleges and high schools for that matter that the school in question is meeting certain acknowledged and recognized standards. So I've seen certainly prospective student athletes coming from schools that are not have not received regional accreditation, uh, coming from more therapeutic environments, for example. Uh, so I, I don't believe um, that a homeschool student would be prohibited from participating in Division One sports. So I'm going to defer to Jim as well on this because I think he might have some perspective on that as well. Yeah. Um, so actually, Rob's passing a just slightly less hot potato into my lap. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> like he, like he, I will, uh, I will claim uh, not having the the great deal of expertise, and it's not a dodge of a of a question. It's the many clauses and sub clauses uh, in terms of eligibility factors, Division One, Two, Three. Um, that that just when you think you've understood a document, well, there may be a change that has occurred since you last last said it. Um, the only time I've really read the full uh, NCAA, um, uh, as you, if you will say, rule book uh, was when we were um, we were. It's not really an audit. It's kind of like a um, it's an examination. Think of it almost as like a reaccreditation. Uh, you know, we get a ton of materials in, in advance, files piled up everywhere, and then they send out some people and, and talk with us on those. And most of those discussions were aligned a lot with our athletic director, you might imagine, and, and our coaches. The best thing I could say is there is, uh, you'll see it, I, I see it anyway, ncaa.org. Uh, Get to that site as soon as you can if you're only thinking about it now. I have a feeling some students have already thought about this and maybe already working with some some coaches. Um, you know. Uh, so I, I did. I, I know. Not you, just jumping this on you, Jim's lap, I did just pull up the NCAA website and typed in homeschool students. They have a whole section about it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that was going to be my next comment. Not surprisingly, uh, it, it looks like a pretty simplified process, and that doesn't surprise me, but there is some steps that everybody yeah. has to go through, and like every student who wants to be, play sports in college, particularly at the Division I or Divi Division II level, students have to register with the NCAA. Uh, right. You have to create your eligibility account, for lack of a better term. Uh, that's going to collect a lot of information about your high school, your transcript, um, and in this homeschooled environment, uh, the homeschool administrator has to submit certifications about the courses taken, uh, grading methodologies, and so forth, uh, in order to demonstrate that the student is in fact eligible because there are GPA requirements as well as course content requirements and mm. required to be satisfied in order to play college sports. And that's mm. true of everybody, not just homeschool students. Um, so again, ncaa.org, type in homeschooled, and you'll pull up a whole bunch of information about how to demonstrate your eligibility for participation in college sports so perfect yeah exactly that's what i would recommend um we work a lot with student athletes and it's very different if a student wants to play in a division one versus a division two versus a division three sport there are different requirements uh different things that those call you know that the ncaa is going to be looking for so ncaa.org is really your best friend um also talk to your coach so i'm 
assuming that if you want to be a college athlete, you're probably playing on a team. Um, that coach is probably very familiar with the recruitment process also. So um, be working with them and get some help about that. So perfect answers, guys. I, I appreciate that. All right, so real quick, let's talk about letters of recommendation before, um, before we run out of time this evening. We have talked a lot about a counselor letter recommendation and understanding that perhaps, you know, our homeschooling students don't necessarily have a school counselor that they're working with. It's probably mom or dad or, or whatever grown up happens to be their administrator, um, so to speak, in their process. So what you know, who is the best, is that the best individual to write a letter of recommendation? Might there be other people that might write a letter of recommendation? And what format might you prefer for a letter of recommendation? And this goes across the board, you know, because certainly every student's going to have letters of recommendation coming in. Do you like a narrative type of, you know, written out nice words, um, paragraph to paragraph about the student? Or is it okay to use a bulleted format? Is it okay to use a bulleted format, maybe bold some of the words so that you draw attention to those particular characteristics of a student. Um, so who and how? Um, Mercy, let's start with you on this one. Yes, for sure. Um, I think that when we're talking about recommendation letters, uh, the preference will be, at least in my opinion, that those letters are coming from from teacher or someone who has instructed the student during high school. Um, so thinking of, uh, you know, a math teacher that can has taught you one or two courses or anyone along those lines that you think can give a full picture of who you are as a student. The recommendation letter is basically where we see your education in context. We, yes, we see the transcript, but the recommendation letter is where we actually get to um, read the story about how you have performed academically in a course, or if it's a counselor recommendation letter or primary educator recommendation letter, over the four years. Um, in terms of a format, um, I will say that I, I personally do not care as much for the format as much as the information that is conveyed. Um, if it is a bulleted um, list um, that includes words, sentences, um, that I can obtain the same knowledge that I would obtain from a letter, totally fine with me specifically. Um, but I will say that let us have to give some details, some explanations, some examples um, of how the student have, has mastered the content of the class, um, the skills of the class. And I think that the letter is definitely that, think about it, uh, think about it, this masterpiece where um, the teacher gets to explain point by point, by point what, but what this student has been able to achieve um, throughout that course. So definitely I would prefer a teacher um, Something that we recommend at and some College as well, since we place a lot of emphasis on what we call academic courses, so courses like English, math, um, is that it's a teacher from one of those areas. Um, I see a lot of students who want to send a recommendation letter from a coach, um, or someone who has mentored them throughout, you know, the last four years. You can send those as well, but I will always um, give preference to seeing letters from um, individuals who have taught you. So, you know, the teachers first and then if there's any other individuals that um, you've you've have had an impact in your education you would like to ask them for a letter um, you can ask them as well perfect perfect and Robert Jim any comments about that uh, I'll chime in with a few other other additional points uh, again the recommendation letters are helpful to us and again as Jim has pointed out several times and correctly that the material we're collecting in an application helps provide and define context. And the recommendation letters do a great job of doing that. They provide an additional level of detail that helps us interpret things like the transcript more fully and more properly, um, possibly explaining trends or patterns of achievement or difficulty that the student may have had, how the student overcame difficulty, all these kind of behavioral issues that can be very helpful in understanding the student's readiness for college level work at the college in question. So. Um, I would agree with what Mercy mentioned previously that we prefer to see recommendation letters from either a school counselor or, or an academic subject teacher uh, as opposed to a person who is observing the student from a distance uh, in some capacity. Uh, but the, the, the because again, essentially what we're trying to measure in an admissions process is a student's readiness for success at the college in question. So having faculty members from the high school level who can talk to that readiness for success is very, very helpful to us. 
And again, one way to get at that is to talk about behaviors that the student has exhibited or developed uh, over time during their high school academic career. It's important to note, I think, for in all contexts here, no admissions office expects a student to be a finished product. Uh, we don't expect perfection of students coming out of the high school years. We expect kids to be developing and continue to develop through their high school years, and then they'll continue to develop through their college years. So to the extent that the recommendation letters highlight that ongoing development, that's a wonderful thing to see. So uh, the thing that I, I'm thinking about right now is a recommendation letters that say this kid's perfect. Well, that's a tough thing to believe, frankly. Um, uh, looking at myself or looking at my own family or looking at people I've worked with over the years, so none of us are perfect. Uh, so we're looking to understand how the development the developmental process has unfolded over time. Uh, and inevitably, there are challenges and there are hurdles that have to be overcome. Sometimes we meet them successfully, sometimes we don't. Uh, and how students how students engage that process is a measure of character, it's a measure of their ability, because it's, it's also a predictor of how well they're going to handle college, because inevitably, the kid who's a straight-A kid in high school, chances are they're going to meet one or two obstacles when they get to college, uh, no matter how prepared they are. Um, so our goal is to try and understand how students are going to encounter those challenges and how they're going to persevere through the challenges that inevitably they'll face when they get to college. And again, so on the back, recommendation letters help us with that. Perfect. Yeah, so, so if the parent is that core instructor on those subjects, the math, English, science, all of that, so is it fully appropriate then for the parent to provide that letter of recommendation and hit on those? those things you just discussed? Yes, um, uh, although I, I, the only caveat I provide is it's really helpful for the parent to take off the parent hat and put on the objective educator hat. And that is to find, uh, you know, again, I, I, not to find fault, that's the wrong word, but to find, uh, assign or identify areas where the young person has grown and developed and what the challenge was and how he or she overcame those challenges. Yeah, we tend to get, be somewhat suspicious of a glowing recommendation that says nothing but wonderful things. I think that's an excellent point too, is that we expect that there might be a weakness in there, here and there, they are young people. Um, you know, they're 16, 17, 18 years old. Um, I, I think I'm still growing in some places too. So um, it's really okay that, you know, to, to talk about, you know, a student's, struggle with this particular course and what they did about it and how they met those struggles because again that shows how they're going to perform in college when they hit that wall or when that struggle comes along that gives uh, the educators or the admission office a really good idea of what that's going to look like so yeah so that's perfect thank you with that all right so um with standardized testing we did talk a little bit about um what that's going to look like for students. I didn't know if there would be further questions, um, perhaps from our listeners. And if you do have some questions about standardized testing, absolutely send those in for us so that we can address those for you. Um, but I'm going to keep moving along um, to the next topic in, unless somebody has some more questions about that. Um, one of the things that I think is important to, to speak to just a little bit um, is students who might have an IEP or a 504 or may have had that if they were in the public school setting um, or they have a documented disability of some type, how is or to what extent maybe might a student reveal that information through the admission process? Is it something that they must disclose to admissions? Is it something they will want to disclose to admission? Um, how does that work? Maybe starting with Mercy. <laughs> Go for it. I actually, I'm so sorry. Um, I just wanted to share that I have to leave right now to go on to my class. Um, oh, but I wanted to thank you all. <laughs> I want to thank you all for the opportunity. Um, and once again, um, Karen, I hope you can share my email address sure um, with our attendees. If you have any questions, I'm more than able to help all of you. Thank well, you. Have a good day. Thanks, Mercy, so much. Take care. Thanks Take for the care. great information. All right, I'm going to defer over. I'm going to move over to Jim. Sure. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, She's obviously continuing her education. <laughs> it, it's been remarkable over the years um, to uh, see how the energy around issues of disclosure or non, not disclosing have, have, have gone. 
um, I, I, there was in the atmosphere many years ago, maybe I'm going to say 20 years ago, or maybe even 25, um, there were some who were concerned that uh, folks were getting access to folks who could, um, you know, kind of uh, provide a, a disability report, um, and I'm thinking more of a narrative, uh, that, uh, that might not add as much information to be helpful for us after all. And what I've seen over the years in terms of as this question has moved along is one, it's become much less of a, a pressured question. It's kind of a norm to you know talk about right now. And we see students with you know disabilities, um, and some of them tell us, some of them decide, no, I want to wait for admission. And then when I get admission, I'm going to go to your um, uh, development uh, and, and learning coordinating center and talk to those good good folks, you know. So I, I tend to see the uh, most effective uh, uh, reports from a student about a dis disability is when they talk about it really in kind of a, um, a trajectory. It's, you know, it, it's, it's fine to say, well, you know, I, I have a specific learning disability, but when was that, when was that, um, when was that assessed? And wow, look what you've done since. And I think it's the, but what I've done since is what I find very interesting um, because it really often does uh, speak uh, to handling hardship uh, and setbacks and so forth and still reaching a point of college readiness by that senior year. So I'm, again, not required. There are a number of ways you can go about it. But if for me, when I hear that kind of information, particularly if someone's decided that a, you know a, a college counselor or someone else uh, doesn't want to pick up on that because they don't want to they don't want to potentially share something that that they weren't supposed to share. So. And Jim, uh, Jim, sorry, you are Jim. Rob, I'm looking at Jim saying Rob. <laughs> <laughs> it happens all the time. <laughs> I think we're going to share again. I think for the student who has, has a moment in their academic history where things all of a sudden come together because of additional academic support they're reading, that's helpful for us to know about. It's helpful to identify, uh, and students should feel comfortable doing so. Um, that being said, there's other things that we don't need to know. At least I'm going to speak somewhat specific to the UNH and maybe more generally to the field is that you need not share your IEP or your 504 documentation with an admissions application. Um, we're not going to read it bluntly. Um, we're not qualified to read it. Um, and the process is designed uh, to be essentially a parallel process for admission and for the consideration of eligibility for services through whatever the office's name has to, happens to be at UNH, it's Student Accessibility Services. Jim mentioned something at Dartmouth had a different title, but they all do the same thing trying to provide support to students who, who might benefit from some additional supports to allow them to be successful. Those offices want to see the IEP 504, whatever testing documentation may have been assembled in support of the student's diagnosis, and that's a very important thing to do. Uh, we will not read it in the admissions office. It will be moved on upstairs to the office that manages that. We happen to be upstairs from admissions at the UNH. Uh, what we're focusing on is the academic record because the academic record has to be viewed uh, without prejudice um, with regard to a student's ability to be successful at the institution in question. Uh, so no college I know of is gonna make an adjustment in their admission criteria to accommodate a student who have, has some kind of disability. Uh, the student can't, they're not gonna get the benefit of that consideration or judgment when they're taking classes in college because the faculty have one standard for grading, not two. Uh, yeah. So. Our interest is admitting students who demonstrated the readiness by, as evidenced by courses taken, grades earned, skills development, that they can move into a college classroom successfully. There is one exception that we do employ on our campus, and maybe others do too, and that is the requirement that you complete a certain number of years of foreign language during your high school years. And 
the example here is if a student has a language-based disability who and the existence of which is deemed a reason not to take a foreign language in the high school years, uh, and that determination is made by school counselors, high school faculty, and others in the school district, uh, if that is determined to be the case, then we will not require the student take a foreign language as a requirement for admission. But interestingly, if a student has a Bachelor of Arts degree or seeking a Bachelor of Arts degree at UNH, they are going to be required to satisfy the foreign language requirement. Now, there are different ways to do that, but they don't waive graduation requirements for anybody. And that's an important thing to consider. So it's sort of a longer answer than maybe it should be. Uh, but yeah, share the information about your, dis your learning disability if you think it's relevant, but most kids don't, frankly. Um, uh, and if they are submitting documentation, it needs to go to the right office so that office can consider your, your eligibility for those services should you be admitted and should you enroll at that institution. And the one piece of advice that I would share is that if a high school senior right now uh, does have a learning disability and is receiving some various types of support services, don't wait until September to start seeking out those services from the college in question. Make sure you're beginning that conversation in January, February, March of your senior year, well in advance of this first semester or first day of classes, because you want those services in place for the first day of classes. Absolutely. Those are some really great points. I thank you for that. I would have forgotten some of those as I was speaking, so that is excellent. And we've come to the end of my questions. Michelle, do we have some questions from our listeners at this point? There we go. I unmuted. Uh, yes, we have just a little bit. I want to reiterate on the whole SAT or ACTs. Sure. Yeah. So it's, you did mention earlier in the talk that one, co some of the COVID closures have made SAT and ACT exams not available uh, or very, very difficult to get enrolled for those. So should a homeschooler still try to get those tests uh, to help have that apples to apples comparison or uh, even if that test school that they're applying for has test optional uh, choices for, for homeschoolers, should they still pursue it? A great question. Gentlemen, who would like to start? <laughs> well, I mean, there are a lot of difficult choices that uh, we're making daily right now uh, that didn't used to be. And um, for, so I think where I begin is I would not make, uh, you, you can't do anything about if you want to take standardized testing and there's nothing within your area that is going to enable you to do that and do that in a in a situation that is conducive to your being successful with that experience i think it's also important that students and families uh determine what their own threshold is for safety slash risk for should there be a test center available that has people go in even socially distance and take that examination. Um, it's been ma um, amazing really to watch how it affects um, very sophisticated test agencies, College Board, uh, ACT, they've been doing this stuff forever and ever. But um, this is really um, something that I don't think anyone could have predicted, uh, you know. But it's interesting, I expect that in some ways we'll be better for the experience. I think we'll come out of it a, a bit better in terms of putting testing in perspective. So I, I guess that's a long way of saying, if you can, you know, if you uh, know it's relatively easy to get to a test center, you feel it's a, a safe spot, um, and they're actually gonna have that center open on the day that they say they will, fine. Otherwise, I'm not so sure. Yeah, I, I, would, I would agree with that, and I would only also add that when a college says they're test optional, it means they're test optional. You don't have to start reading between the lines, wondering or trying to divine whether or not a school truly wants those test scores. The answer is they don't care. Uh, right. If we say we're test optional, it's your decision to decide yeah. whether or not you want to submit test scores. And there's not going to be any questions answered, asked of you uh, to defend that decision or choice, uh, nor is there any uh, admission downside, uh, frankly, to not submitting your test scores 
uh, in this day and age in particular. I think Jim's point about weighing the personal safety issues and considerations for taking a standardized test are, are now more than ever real. Uh, I don't think anybody ever thought twice about sitting in a, a room of 150 to 200 other people and thinking about it. But now you, you really do have to think about that. Yeah. Is it a wise choice? And I think many would argue that it's it's not a, not an effective solution for a lot of people. So if you're debating whether or not it's worth taking, I would be, feel comfortable making a decision not to submit them if that's the right answer for you as a family. Yeah. I have to agree. Just, you know, once again, having listened in on so many different webinars with various colleges around the country, this is something that is completely unprecedented. You know, we, we're in a pandemic. It's worldwide. Um, it's not unique to New Hampshire. Um, so colleges that you may be looking at, you know, outside of our state are going to be in the same situation that, you know, Dartmouth and the University of New Hampshire are in. Um, so I think, you know, I don't really know many schools that are not test optional, at least for this admission cycle, and that does mean test optional. So if you're unable to or or you don't feel safe submitting those scores or sitting for those tests, I think that's truly um, truly something that is okay. So I think that those are great, great guidelines that we get from Dartmouth and from the University of New Hampshire, for sure. Michelle, do we have any other questions that we can make sure we answer? Nope, that seems to cover it quite thoroughly. Thank you. Amazing. Um, I'll just what, in yeah, go ahead, I, I did send uh, Karen and Michelle a link. I was just going to uh, say. <laughs> that NCAA website uh, for homeschool students. So you can share that if, if you want. Excellent. Thank you so much. Yes, yeah, so we'll share that out. Um, but there is what's called a homeschool, because I can tell from the link that there's a homeschool toolkit. Um, with the NCAA for for our students who are homeschooled. So that is fantastic, right? There are a bunch of our answers that we might have been um, trying to figure out tonight. So that can definitely help our listeners. And again, I think one of the important messages, and I'm going to let our panelists have the final word here, but I think one of the really big messages that I found, you know, certainly from from all three of our panelists this evening is always reach out. You know, there's no silly question in this process. Things are going to change right now. Things are changing so rapidly that, you know, even those of us who are on the other side of the desk um, in this college world right now are constantly updating how we're doing things. So, you know, feel free to reach out. Um, make sure you go ahead and do that. Reach out to, you know, your local public high school. Reach out to us at the Center for College Planning. Reach out to Michelle. Reach out to Rob and to Jim and to Mercy to get all of those questions answered for you. And now what I would definitely want to do is leave the last word with our gentlemen of the panel. Um, final words for our listeners tonight, any thoughts that you might be able to leave them with, whether it's COVID related, whether it's transcript related, homeschool related, or just in general um, in the world of admissions. Mm -hmm. And I don't mind who starts. Jim, yeah, maybe? I'll, I'll jump in, okay. Go for um, it. Uh, it's, it's, it's a really remarkable time. I think that's all I keep, keep saying over and over and over. It's a remarkable time um, because we've talked about um, how COVID has uh, affected access to test centers and so forth, which is obviously very important to admission. Uh, but I'm thinking in just kind of the recent past, we've had uh, at least one or two hurricanes that have, uh, submerged what used to be towns. Uh, we've got an absolutely brutal situation out on the West Coast. And the, a lot of those towns had high schools that no longer are standing. So we're going to have to work together in a lot of interesting ways um, to support education in general and support students who want to end up at our, our campuses. I believe we're up to it because I think of my colleagues and I know they're being very thoughtful about this. And then there are some of my colleagues who it's like an even additional level with disruptions that are going on globally, the, the folks who deal with our international students. So I would hope at the end of the night, the folks who were able to attend the session 
understand you're actually in relatively good place. Um, we, we have experience. Uh, we can work together. We can find ways to support you, you know, uh, and we will respond to your, your contacts to us. The other thing that you, I'm just going to say at the end here is um, I've been impressed um, for years with the uh, effort out of um, Concord, uh, NEF, various uh, uh, staff members and so forth, and the dedication that's gone into trying to help uh, New Hampshire residents uh, realize college from all kinds of backgrounds. And there's a, there are a lot of success stories. So I just wanna say, I'm, I'm very appreciative that you uh, invited me to um, be with you tonight. Uh, and I look forward to working with you uh, arm in arm for the next one. You know you can't get away, Jim. So. <laughs> <laughs> We've been, I think Rob, Jim and I have been working together for, for pretty close to 30 years. So <laughs> these two, I'm sorry guys, but <laughs> my go-to, can you be on a panel? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. I appreciate it so much. I think it's a combined effort around our state for, for all of our students, and, and we appreciate that as well. And Rob, some final words for our listeners tonight. Uh, sure. Again, I agree with everything Jim just shared, and I would add uh, just a couple of thoughts. One is the process of applying to college is it, it shouldn't be viewed as a barrier to your next step it's really just a process you go through to identify the best possible solution for you and there are literally thousands of solutions out there where you might want to go to college uh, and the process the challenge of this process is it's trying to sort through all those options and it does require you as a student uh, to think about what matters to you. What are your values and expectations? And for many people, it's the first time they've been asked to think about themselves in exactly those terms. So define for me in a succinct manner, what are your values and expectations for the next couple of years of your life? I'm not asking you to plan out your career or what you're gonna be doing at 40 or 50, but rather, what do you wanna do between 18 and 22 years old? Even then, that's a bit of a stretch because who knows how four years is going to evolve for you. But rather, what's important to you now and how can that help you identify places where you'll be happy? And that word, happy, is a very important consideration. Uh, when you're happy, you're, ten you're going to be inclined to do well academically. You're inclined to do well socially. You'll take appropriate risks that will push you and help you grow and develop. Um, so all of us want you to be happy in the choices that you make. Um, and for that, I think it's important to think about this process as not as a competition, but really as a, a, a self-serving process that's going to help you find a place where you're going to be happy and successful. Uh, you hear faculty members talk about kids who do well. Um, one of the things they'll often say when they describe them, they say they're happy. They really enjoy what they're doing. And they, when they're enjoying what they're doing, they're really engaging and committing themselves to the learning process and taking advantage of the possibilities that the institution the student has chosen to attend afford afford them so i'd encourage you to think carefully about this process i think about starting with who you are what matters to you and then applying that knowledge to the schools that you're going to look at and learn about and you've got some great resources here to take advantage of and many who aren't on this call who want to help you uh, i think most of us who go into this line of work do it because we enjoy working with students and we like the idea of helping them make good choices and realizing more about themselves over the years so Keep that in mind. I think you'll be well served. Perfect. And Michelle, any final words for our listeners? I, I just want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. This has been really quite a, a benefit, I believe, to the homeschool community who don't typically have access to these opportunities to talk with admissions people or to hear directly from you. So thank you so much for sharing your time with us tonight. I really appreciate it. We absolutely do. We did, um, I'll just mention real quick that we did record our presentation this evening and we'll be putting um, this recording up on um, both the NEEF website and also Michelle, we're gonna be putting that up on your website um, for our homeschool families to find. Um, so if you have friends who weren't able to tune in or somebody who needed to leave early, we, we know life is busy. So we will get those recordings up for you just as soon as possible. Um, but again, thank you so much for joining us tonight um, and have a great evening. Take care. Bye. Thank you. See you later.